Welcome back to Hard for Games, everybody. I'm your host, Tony, and it has finally happened. We have discovered a beta version of a Nintendo 64 disk drive game on a blue development disk. Thanks to the tireless efforts of Andrew E. and the technical expertise of Luigi Blood, I present to you all the beta of Mario Artist Paint Studio, complete with never before seen content. Let's go ahead and get into it. So for anyone unfamiliar, Mario Artist Paint Studio is not just a sequel, or depending on how you think about it, spiritual sequel to the Mario Paint game for the Super Nintendo. It is also one part in a three-part set of Mario Artist Studio games for the 64 disk drive. There's Mario Artist Paint Studio, obviously, Mario Town Studio, Mario Polygon Studio, and there was also a fourth disc, which was a piece of software known as Mario Artist Communication Kit, which was used to swap data through the games as well as upload the player's creations to the RANnet internet service. So that's right, you could go online via your 64 through the DD, through RANnet, only in Japan. Now, these four pieces of software are what actually came out in the series. There was much more planned that ultimately got canceled. If you know the history of the DD, you know it was a failed system, hence it only coming out in Japan and only selling a scant number of units. Altogether, if everything was released, it would have kind of formed a pretty robust art-making studio and a relatively okay consumer-grade game-making suite. Now, we've covered Mario Artist Paint Studio in the past a number of times, both in Japanese and also in English, via Luigi Blood's English patch for the game, which is super convenient. But before we go into this prototype, I want to re-familiarize, because I figure if I had to replay this game multiple times to get used to it again, a review wouldn't hurt for all of you. So the game starts you off with four primary options. From left to right, first we have 2D Paint Mode. Then animation mode, i.e. the Game Boy camera and N64 capture cartridge mode. Next up we have 3D World, where the player can manipulate textures, i.e. draw on them, explore, and simply watch creations roam around in 3D. And lastly we have gallery mode, where you can instantly and conveniently see your creations. Now, most of these options here are just journeys through menus and menus and menus. So, for ease of understanding, I'm going to be comparing an English patched retail version to the Japanese prototype version. So, let's begin the comparison. Here we have the retail title screen. It has background music and contains sort of a demo feature where if you don't press start, it'll load up a random assortment of stamps from the game. Here's the beta title screen. No music. No stamps, no frills. Here's the main menu. From left to right, again, we have 2D paint, animate, or basically capture footage mode, 3D world, and gallery. Here's the prototype, only two options. On the left, we have 2D paint mode, and on the right, we actually have the 3D world mode, although here it's called 3D movie, but it uses what became the animate icon in the retail for its 3D movie mode. There are no separate gallery or animation capture modes in this prototype because they were incorporated at this time into the 2D paint mode. Now within the 2D paint feature of the beta lies what is arguably the most exciting difference. It is a Nat Attack minigame, and this is 100% absent from the retail build. Basically, you select 2D paint, you scroll almost all the way down, click a coffee icon, and the game boots up. And by the way, I know it says flies, but because of the Nat Attack game in Mario Paint for the Super Nintendo, I'm just calling them Nats by default. I love how bubbly and Mario-themed this game is. Now, what's especially exciting is that on the second stage, there's a model of a development or blue-rimmed Nintendo 64 disk drive. 
and it is unclear as to why the development system was modeled versus the retail system. Perhaps the intention was to eventually swap it out, or maybe the original artist only ever having seen development gear didn't know the retail version wasn't going to have that blue lip around the disc insert. I don't know. Now one thing that Andrew brought to my attention is that the DD model actually seems to be half modeled and then mirrored. You can tell because there's actually a line down the center where it's like they built out one side and then just kind of took it and flipped it, mirrored it, pieced it together, <laughs> and that was it. Uh, so not only, again, do you see that line down the middle, but also it has redundant eject buttons. Around the disc insert, there's, there's two eject buttons, but one disc insert. It's... whatever. I don't know. Didn't make it into the game anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter. Another interesting note is that we have the Super Mario 64 startup screen here in the background, even though clearly this is not a disk drive game. My assumption is that the developers just wanted something recognizable for the background, and Mario related. So after beating all of the stages, you are treated to a boss, and then the stages repeat, and they get harder. And each round of complete stages that you beat, you are awarded a medal. Now, according to Luigi Blonde, the game loops with harder versions of all four stages until the sixth loop, where it goes back to the original difficulty by mistake. The game also crashes after trying to award the sixth medal, as it was not intended to have more than five. Speaking of the medals, the game has again, five different medals, but only ever showcases the first one. Just the first one over and over and over again. For some reason it has the other ones in there, but it just never accesses them and places them on screen. So let's actually dive into the 2D paint feature now. First we're going to go into menu differences and then discuss some of the functionality differences. This is the retail version, and on the left-hand side here you can see the first page of the menu slash tools that you can utilize in this mode. Now here's the beta version. The retail's top option is exit. The prototype's top option is gallery view. Different icons for the shapes tool, fill tool, the dog slash undo was redesigned for the retail version, as was the down slash next arrow, which takes you to the next page of tools. Here we have page two of three of the tools, or section two of three, whatever you want to call it. And most icons here are redesigned or reordered. Here's the retail version. Here's the prototype version. So for example, the N64 icon that you see here is for game-related backgrounds. You know, it could be Banjo-Kazooie, or Yoshi Story, or Mario, or Zelda, or, or whatever. And it has its own icon here. In the retail version, these backgrounds were just bundled into a menu that contained other backgrounds. It wasn't its own singular thing. Scrolling down again, we have the third page of tools. First up, like before, here's the retail. And here we have the prototype version. At this point, we're starting to get into less creative options and more just settings. But as you can see here, the icons look different and the arrangement is different as well. One of the similarities, though, is that they both feature the option to utilize the Game Boy camera and the N64 capture cartridge. So in the retail version, there are redundant ways to get to this feature, either via the main menu or here, whereas the beta version you have to scroll down, down, down to be able to access these. The beta version actually has an additional page of settings, whereas the retail game only has three, basically because things are less bundled together in the beta version. Here you can find color palette settings, mouse cursor settings in terms of the speed, music settings, and the Nat game. Oh, and also the exit, which you have to scroll all the way down for to access. <laughs> now let's go ahead and get into some of the features and oddities, starting with the tools on this menu here. 
So first off, the mouse speed in both versions has three different options for settings, slow, medium, fast. But in the beta version, all settings are faster. My guess is that this is probably to accommodate the Nat game. While you're watching this though, do note that this is me playing with a controller and not my N64 mouse, which I sold a bit back because I didn't know that this would be popping up. The top option of the prototype's fourth page is the color palette selection. In both versions, this page is used to select color and drag it to the palette. The ball at the bottom can be rolled or moved to adjust the brightness. Now, in the retail version, you can lock onto the ball and slide it back and forth. But the beta version seems to have completely different controls. It will lock onto the ball, but you can't slide once it's locked on. The only way I can seemingly get this thing to move is if I take a running start with the cursor. I have to whip across the screen, briefly lock onto the ball, and it'll slide a touch in the direction that the cursor was going. And I have to do that over and over again to get brighter or darker. It's obviously in a very broken state here. Finally, within the last page, there is a screen size adjuster tool, which does not appear in retail. Let's go ahead and talk about the art. So, in the retail game, stamps can be placed anywhere, including an existing canvas. Pretty easily at that. Notice the hand icon over the stamp, you just sort of pluck the image up and place it wherever you want. In the beta, the stamps slash N64 character stamps must be cut out and pasted to be placed over anything existing, and this is done manually. You must select a new sheet before opening them, or they will replace your current work. They will just wipe clean what you're doing. So basically, you open up a new page, then you open up the stamp, you have to manually cut out the stamp, then go back to the other page and place it where you want it. It's super tedious and was very confusing. And here's what happens when I do it wrong. Anything I may have wanted to place this stamp over is gone. An interesting note from Luigi Blood is that the prototype backgrounds, like the game backgrounds for example, are forced at 640 by 480. In the retail version, they're 216 by 202 or 320 by 240 depending on the canvas size. So the high resolution mode of 640x480 was completely removed from the retail version. Especially when comparing the two, you realize how incredibly good looking the high resolution mode was. It's really a shame they got rid of it. I don't think I've seen images this clear on an N64 ever. Now that I have my magnum opus here, let's talk about saving it to the disc. Here's the retail save screen. Here's the beta. In the retail game, the player has 10 default folders, whereas in the beta you have two, and the player can create or delete more. Now let's move on to the 3D world slash 3D movie mode. These are mostly the same, but there are some minor differences. So here's the menu system in retail. And here's the beta version. So similar to the 2D paint mode, the tools are rearranged. Uh, so for example, exit is at the bottom of the prototype with a different icon, and the movie viewer watch icon is also different. So for example, in the beta, you have a magnifying glass, and in the retail version, you have two eyes. Also, you can probably see that more models are immediately available on the right-hand side to manipulate in the beta. Whereas in retail, you need to unlock these. Both versions have this exploration mode where basically your avatar just leisurely moves around and takes a look at these pretty well-crafted models. Actually, for the N64, these look really good. Uh, but essentially what you want to do is just take photos of the wildlife and the game rates you on them. You'll notice here that the retail version removed a redundant option. So your retail options here, once you take a photo, are save or return to the photo mode. In the prototype, you have save, return to the photo mode, or 
exit. So that's pretty much it. Now, obviously, the Nat Attack game was the most heart-pounding out of all of those. The rest of them were mostly, like, menu differences, but when you really think about it, it allows you to sort of understand how the developers were thinking about the game and how they slowly streamlined the user experience, combining things where appropriate, rearranging icons based on how you would play the game. It's interesting to see it go from point A to point B. Now, there are a bunch of people I want to thank for allowing me to be able to showcase this to all of you. The dump was actually done by Andrew E. Uh, he's been a longtime friend of the show. He, back years ago, asked me to dump one of his, his DD dev discs, and I still occasionally dump content for him, but as far as the DD goes, he has his own equipment now, and he's well past needing my help. But regardless of that, he still shared all of this with me and allowed us as Hard for Games to do an exclusive first look and showcase of the game. So I really, really appreciate it. And also, of course, Luigi Blood, who had to do a lot of technical tinkering to get this to work on emulator and also created a writer program for me so I could play it on this disc here because the disc that Andrew has um, requires additional hardware and will not boot either on my or his DD. So he spent a lot of time doing that and also just cataloging differences for us as well. Last but not least, you know, I want to thank Metal Jesus Rocks because you know, back in, I think it was 2016, he found his American Prototype 64DD, invited me out to Seattle to do an episode with him, and it really brought a lot of eyes on the channel. And with those eyes came a lot of trust in us in terms of being able to preserve and save lost media and content. So in essence, him finding that prototype DD really sparked our ability to move forward with a ton of lost media preservation, whether it be for the 64 or the 64 DD or Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. We've had a lot of SNES stuff come through, tons of GameCube stuff, uh, the Pokemon Center New York content that we've preserved. Realistically, no one have, would have really found us without him inviting me out to Seattle, because we were a lot smaller than we are now. And we're not a huge channel already, so again, thank you so much. And of course, I want to thank you all, the viewers, and our Patreon supporters as well. Thank you so much, and we'll see you all next time.